justification people dared to speak of migration. Who was not speaking of climate change and of migration was the migration people. So we had one side of the coin and we were in the side that it's most important for IOM with no space for it. Of course, that's why I think IOM space has been very important and the regional space has been key. There are lots of regional uh, processes in particular also the Pacific, but also in Eastern Africa, Western Africa, also the Central America, Southern America, all of them now and Asia speak of uh, migration in relation to climate change. And finally, woo, we had what? The Global Compact. So the Global Compact on Migration, it's not binding, but it's historical for us in the community that works on migration because we have a written text that was negotiated, even if not necessarily approved by all, but that gives you very specific elements on migration, environmental issue, even relation to degradation of the environment and desertification, it speaks of adaptation, it quotes the Paris Agreement, so it's very advanced, much more advanced than the compact on refugees, where there's only climate that survived, change disappeared, and there's uh, environmental and disaster, so that's very important that they recognize also disasters. What I wanted to then to say, it's a bit this environmental degra um, land degradation, what do we know about it and migration? And I wanted just to show you this. <coughs> we have a new report that we have just released at a, a COP of UNCCD in New Delhi. I think it was one week or two weeks ago. And this report really makes the connection between land issues, so management, degradation, rehabilitation, um, issues also around hum a bit about human rights and land grabbing and the importance of land tenure issues, and migration. So what we know, just to, to say a few things about, uh, about this, um, really specifically on land, it's we know people are at risk. And we know projections of desertification and drought, and we know projection especially of dry lands. So we know, for instance, that, I don't know, like to give you one statistic I have here, 686 million people in Africa and Asia have been affected since 2008 by drought. We know that 3 billion people in the world live in dry land. So we know how many people live in areas that are subject to extreme heat and projection and desertification and the IPCC report has set also very interesting statistics about this exposure. The problem we have is that what we hear is that these all are migrants and in fact it's not how it works. Not because you are in a, also we have the same issue now with oceans. IPCC ocean report was just released uh, two days ago and now I have always question. You said that 200, uh, 2 million 82 uh, people live in area will be displaced. No, they live in areas that are low-lying and are subject to sea level rise, erosion and coastal issues. The same with land. We know that they are exposed. It does not make these people migrants or displaced. Many people will not even have the, move, the, the means to move. And also we hope now that there will be some, some action that will prevent this displacement to happen, plus there can be migration policy that makes this migration a positive way, out of harm's way, not displacement. So we have this issue that we don't really have all data. There are data, I think maybe you will speak also about the World Bank data, and there is also, um, for instance, IOM's displacement tracking matrix data now. We manage now to have from the population we assist data on drought as a factor of migration, but it's always very often mixed and hidden. And this is one of the core of our issues and all the debate around also giving a status to people who move because of the environment is that it's very difficult to isolate the environmental factors from other factors. And in the case of land, we are at the heart of this difficulty because it's very much connected to economic and poverty issues. So that's one thing I want to say, and just to conclude, if I still have uh, um, uh, two minutes, okay.
So what we see also very much is that the main types of migration that are impacted are internal migration and very much rural to urban migration. This is very much the case in Asia, in Africa, which means that the policies we need to look at in this context of land degradation and migration are rather internal management issues rather than, uh, <laughs> than uh, international policy issues. It's for me to go away, in fact. <laughs> Then we, very interestingly, what comes all the time from all, every single region is the issue of pastoralism and the impact on pastoralist livelihoods and people having to change their, their roots and sometimes becoming irregular migrants because they, they cross borders even without noticing. It's where land issues are key also in fact, the fact that indigenous population then and nomadic population enter in conflict with population who live from agriculture. A lot of impact on seasonal migration. We see this a lot also in the context of Mexico, Guatemala. There is very much a question of temporary migration rather than permanent migration. And a lot of impacts in terms of labor migration. We have cases, for instance, of repeated drought, desertification, land loss uh, of agricultural loss in, for instance, Tajikistan people then moving to Russia for labor migration. You have these cases also in different contexts in, in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire. We have a number of studies that really show the impact of connect, this connection, but they are case studies. It's not a global vision. So just to say, I think, as an impact in terms of activities, and I will conclude on that, I think a key um, recommendation that comes from all the work we do on climate change and migration, but specifically on land issues, is the question of regional agreements when it comes to international policy on migration. So regional agreements and regional dialogues and regional discussions for countries to be better prepared if there are movements that cross borders. And we work very much with a platform on disaster displacement and that follows up the Nansen Initiative on protection of people who move and cross a border. So the regional dimension is key and it's where we focus very much in terms of policy dialogue because countries can be also prepared with better, in a way, migration policies. And then the other domain where we, we see really a possible impact is to look at migration in the development context and on the longer uh, view, like longer term view, and at the whole migration cycle. So in a way it's about greening very traditional migration policy. So for instance, labor migration to better think where do people come from and where do they go for? Is it sustainable where they go from? People who return and are reintegrated with programs back in their countries of origin to connect it to green jobs, to sustainable land management. We have examples now in Niger uh, in the, with the Agades Center collaboration in Senegal programs that work exactly on this. And then there is also this vision about diasporas and migrants reinvesting back in green uh, activities. We had a program with the Italian cooperation where there was support to um, diasporas, for instance, in Senegal, in Italy, to invest back home in land rehabilitation um, activities. And we saw that there is an impact. There is not a major change of migration but it's, we, uh, so people don't stay more, but it changes nevertheless the way they live, in fact. So I thank you very much for that. I think we are at the heart of the human and nature um, debates that we've been seeing here in all over this very rich week. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. I forgot to show you also this. There's an atlas of migration that we produced. And that gives also a view on what I, I've been um, presenting and more generally on the topic. And all of this is available online, correct? Yes. So please um, yeah. take some time to look at those two reports. I'm going to welcome Ambassador Prasad um, to speak now about Fiji's internal relocation guidelines. Thank you very much.
uh, thank you for having me on this uh, panel. And I've been given a long 10 minutes to speak in the building down there. I think three minutes is very long. So I'll try to be closer to the three side. I'm from Fiji. Fiji is a country of 300 plus islands. Depends what time of the day you ask that question. It increases or decreases with the tides. Uh, and uh, it's exposed uh, to all of the calamities, catastrophes, slow onset, etc., of, of climate change. We are done with the talking. We need to protect our communities, and Fiji has identified uh, as a priority 45 uh, communities that need to be relocated. This is a very complicated uh, matter. If you thought uh, it was easy, try, try being in, in the government in which I uh, work for. If all of you were living over here between first, second, and third, and I, I told you that uh, I'll give you all half a million quid to move to some other place, uh, few of you will take it, I know. Most of you will not take it. Uh, that's one. And second, if all of you are living over here between the next three blocks uh, and uh, married to each other, cousins living next door, your church is next door, your school is for the kids is next door, and I said, you know, I'll just... Uh, uh, pluck all of you out and send some to Ohio, some, send some to Ottawa, send a few to Montreal, send a few to Mexico, etc. Uh, the community as we know it ceases to exist. And uh, so that's sort of the choice public, uh, public policy uh, uh, and, uh, and leaders have to make. Very, very complicated uh, uh, discussions. And then when you do come to it that a community needs to be relocated to protect essentially itself, either from slow onset or the threat of a storm surge uh, and more lives lost in the next uh, catastrophe, uh, then uh, things come into play. Move where you have to decide. That, so there are land issues, as we've spoken about. Uh, infrastructure, is there, is there a road to that place? Uh, zoning, and is this going to be a, a, a village community, a, a peri urban community? What type of rules will govern? Uh, that place? Does a social infrastructure exist? Uh, how long will it take to build a school, a health center, etc.? Uh, will we run electricity uh, line or will we not run electricity line and they'll have to live on their own? Will we uh, create a new water supply route? That everything that you imagine uh, that uh, we take for granted when you walk into a room like that, you have to think that through. So it's very, very complicated. This is even before you begin to consider what are the human considerations. Uh, humans belong to a land. Uh, they like to identify uh, with the locality. Uh, they uh, have feelings about the ancestral homes. Uh, uh, their loved ones are buried uh, in, their, uh, in their village uh, lands. Uh, they pray in the churches. That, uh, and it, so it is a church like any other, but everyone is connected to our church at the end of of the day where you'd want to get married or where you'd want your uh, last rites to be held, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's uh, long after you go through the other part that uh, you begin to uh, consider uh, the human considerations of a move. So each move is very, very complicated. And uh, it's, we've started, uh, the third of the communities have been uh, relocated in thinking about this. We have thought about the human rights dimensions as best as we can, informed by UN guidelines and the relevant guidelines, and of course, uh, uh, with uh, taking into regard our own constitution and the obligation that the government has towards all of its citizens to provide life and livelihoods and uh, in safety, etc. Uh, so that's uh, one part uh, uh, of the equation. And second part uh, is that uh, if all of those things were in place and all, everyone in this room agreed to move because you know, all the rights are protected, et cetera, then uh, resources also come into play. So that's the second part. And it's uh, good that I'm uh, addressing you uh, this afternoon because on uh, Monday this week at the Climate Summit, we launched uh, uh, Fiji's Relocation Trust Fund. Community Relocation Trust Fund was launched by my Prime Minister on Monday afternoon at the end of the Climate Summit. And, uh, you know, although the world talks a lot, I don't think uh, there's much generosity and, and money. Uh, so far, we have not had a penny uh, from the international community for this effort. Uh, and the way in which we are funding it is that the country has introduced an, a climate tax that is applied to all citizens and visitors and everybody alike. And uh, that climate tax, a portion of that, uh, takes care of catastrophes, but one portion of that we have earmarked by law, by 
uh, by an act of parliament that goes to fund uh, uh, the, uh, the community re relocation. So that's the, the financing instrument that we put in place and this week we uh, announced it uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, legal framework for that already exists now and uh, uh, the fund is up and up and kicking. So as best as the resources that come through this climate tax comes into the community relocation uh, trust fund, uh, it is at that pace at which uh, Fiji will uh, uh, be re uh, relocating uh, communities. And uh, uh, if uh, the resources were more generous, uh, then we could accelerate the pace and increase the pace, as well as improve the quality of some of the relocation. There will always be pain and heartache. So you can get a new school right, the water will not come at the right uh, right time, or you could get the water extension to these new areas right, but the electricity will not come at the right time. So it's all, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy, but uh, I don't think any government deals with easy problems these days. Uh, uh, but if, if the resources were uh, more generous, we would be one able to do it uh, uh, much more comprehensively, but as well as uh, improve the pace. If you improve the pace, there's a, uh, side of it that uh, the 45 that we have identified to move within the next seven years are one in, not in our, our minds, but what the scientists and others tells us, are uh, at uh, most at risk uh, for losing lives. That's all we are doing. This is not uh, dealing with the slow onset type. This is uh, uh, in, uh, in this era of global warming, the sea level. Uh, uh, sea temperatures rise and then when storms come they become a little bit more fierce and when they're a little bit more fierce then storm surges are much higher and when there's a storm surge that hits a coastal village or inland uh, riverine uh, village uh, when the surge uh, goes down it has a feeling of tsunami and uh, it, it takes everything in its path as the water goes back to the uh, ocean so this is uh, uh, this 45 that uh, we are working with communities uh, uh, totaling about 50,000 people all, all put together are in this category. The slow onset that you spoke about where agricultural lands are being lost because of uh, uh, salinity and people's livelihoods are being destroyed, uh, that's a lifetime away. I mean, we have to think about it. We are thinking about it, uh, but we certainly don't have the resources uh, in this day uh, uh, to talk about. Uh, this morning, uh, we had the a small state summit, and he, uh, not a very, uh, these are essentially small states talking to themselves rather than uh, people who can do something more about the small states. Uh, but we had the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations and uh, uh, my own Prime Minister spoke and uh, Prime Minister of Bahamas and uh, Barbados spoke and uh, several others spoke in that, in that session. I think uh, uh, their message uh, to the world community was how many more uh, UN summits uh, uh, should uh, leaders from these type of countries come at taxpayers' expense and keep on saying the same thing? And probably the answer is, you know, uh, many, many more. Sorry on a depressing note, but thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Prasad. I know I would benefit from a deep breath in, so if that's something that um, you find helpful, I invite you to do that as well. Um, we have next Natasha Bannon, who will be talking about Puerto Rico. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's, again, after lunch, we've had a heavy conversation. It's only going to get heavier. Um, so if you need to stand up and stretch, you know, that's, I mean, but we're here because our lives depend on it. So um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak, perhaps in a very concrete context, the way the ambassador did about the Caribbean. So just yesterday, the day before, the Prime Minister of Barbados said, the Caribbean will not survive climate change. The last three years of hurricane season have basically eradicated a Caribbean island each year, right? 
And two years ago, that was the case of Puerto Rico. So I'm going to try to go through some brief background and then bring you up to, to par a little bit on how this affects both current land use issues and migration patterns. Puerto Rico is really the convergence of what I call the three kind of evil C's right now, disaster capitalism, climate change, and colonialism. And you're seeing how all of that is affecting um, what, what we are seeing and responding to in terming a humanitarian crisis, but it's really much more than that, right? It's a climate crisis, a political and economic disaster, and a human rights crisis as well. The economic crisis which kind of started this really originates from a political crisis. It's a, it's a colony, this colonial relationship, which is, you know, outside of the colonial context, there are neo-colonies, there are a number of island nations and nations that really don't have the economic wherewithal to be able to survive climate change. And that's what we're, what we're seeing, the economic capacity to be able to respond uh, to climate disaster and what the implications are to be able to provide, to resource the types of issues that we've heard about this morning, right? That the, um, the economic crisis that's been stemming for a number of years that kind of exploded a couple of years ago has had vast human rights and humanitarian consequences, including the largest immigration that has provoked in the last 60 years, um, the largest wave of immigration. There are now more Puerto Ricans that live outside Puerto Rico than live on the island for the first time in the island's history. Right? Deep austerity measures in response to the economic crisis leading to a healthcare crisis, a housing crisis, economic cri uh, unemployment crisis, all of this has driven uh, the, the forced migration, and this was prior to hurricanes Irma and Maria, which were in 2017. The perpetual colonial crisis, and you'll see that image on the bottom was what we all saw this past summer and what we call, what I call the Puerto Rican insurrection this summer and the kind of up, uprising, the rebellion that happened in response both to tremendous government and abandonment and corruption, but it was also really about the economic situation and the lack of climate protection for an island that feels every year in the eye of the climate storm, and that continues to feel the brunt of that. Right. So two years ago when hurricanes Irma and Maria, both hurricane level category five storms, um, hit Puerto Rico was really Hurricane Maria that we most know that, that, that most people know that devastated the island that left the island a hundred percent blackout from satellite images at that time it literally didn't appear on the map there was no light it looked like a black spot of the Caribbean and remained that way for months and months and months now for those of us that are either from Puerto Rico or work in Puerto Rico, we know that we don't talk about the hurricane as a natural disaster. It was very much an unnatural disaster. And the response that left people without health care, without water, without housing, without food, without shelter, was the man-made criminal kind of negligent government response. So two weeks ago, when Tropical Storm Karen passed through the hurricane and left Barbados totally destroyed, and hit in Puerto Rico, people began preparing for three months of no food and water. Right? And it wasn't because of what they thought the damage of the storm would be, it was because they were preparing for government abandonment again. That's not different from a lot of other countries and contexts of governments that simply don't either have the political wherewithal or willingness to be able or capacity to respond to what climate harm is going to wreck. That same, the day before the storm passed, there was an earthquake in Puerto Rico. Earthquakes are increasingly more common now in the Caribbean as well that they don't get talked about. And of course, the extreme heat and flood zones. And this is the convergence really within the, that we've seen increasingly within the last five or 10 years. Extreme heat and uh, extreme flooding that's happening. In addition to more and more intense hurricane seasons, Hurricane Maria was the first storm, at least in US history, where there was a conversation, do we need to create another category level of storm? Because of how uh, intense the winds were, right? Category level uh, five being the highest, and there was a conversation around, do we need a six, right? Because every year, the hurricane season, are, they're more frequent and they're more um, damaging. Some of the human rights consequences that we've seen as a result of um, this kind of evil convergence, but particularly the climate, 
And in response, if we're going to have to shift resources to provide for people, what have we seen in Puerto Rico? We've seen the closure of public schools, including higher education and, um, and, and uh, K through 12 public education, that there are you know, emergency vehicles that have no diesel. Puerto Rico is an island, as many island nations, gets most of its food, most of its supplies, from either trade or from the United States or from other nations that bring it in. What we saw after the hurricane is that there were no ships that were allowed to come in or didn't have the capacity. People were left without gas, not just water and food, but you have economies whose um, and, you know, agricultural economy was, uh, was obliterated in service to other economic needs. And so they have no food sovereignty. They have no ability and capacity to produce their own nutritional um, you know, elements, extremely high poverty rates, et cetera. So in terms of housing and land use, landscape, what does this mean after the hurricane? Two years later, uh, the, the anniversary of the hurricane was last week. Two years later, we still have 30,000 homes that have blue tarps. Those blue tarps were put on by the Federal Emergency Management Agency that was designed to be temporary. Their lives are not designed to, outstand, to, um, to withstand more than six months. It's been over two years for 30,000 homes, 300,000 homes that were never repaired. Right? This was on the eve of the last disaster. And federal government response that has been to withhold funding, but also to allow, uh, to allocate whatever funding for housing in ways that will never reach communities that there's no meaningful community dialogue, participation, public oversight or hearing. Those are for infrastructure projects that are not necessarily in response to community needs. What we've seen now is also how there's been both an incentivizing of uh, corporate actors to come and massive displacement and gentrification plans so that while there's an incentive for you know, external actors, whether it's corporate, multinational, or individuals, bankers, for example, to come and live in Puerto Rico, there's absolutely no incentivizing of Puerto Ricans to be able to stay in Puerto Rico, including fixing their homes, for example. So the, the zoning board uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks has been looking at redefining after the hurricane zoning for the whole island in a way that really um, re, you know, it, it, it promotes, as, as, um, as a Puerto Rican economy said, it promotes, um, it formalizes and legalizes what are previously deemed to be illegal structures, right, where, where illegally built, you know, either homes or hotels or small businesses were, it formalizes them, uh, it, it, it um, uh, makes viable uh, uh, forced displacement, particularly in coastal areas, and it isn't that the government is concerned that people live on coast and that nobody should be on the coastal areas, it's that once those people are, those communities that have historically been on the coast have been displaced, and there's plans for hotels. And then there's, you know, I, you know, industrial plans for those spaces, that it promotes the selling of natural resources. Some of these, I recognize that this is in Spanish, but, you know, 62, uh, 1.3 million acres are going to change qualification, their classification, so that they're not going to be suitable for human use necessarily, but they will be suitable for industrial use. They will be, you know, sold, natural resources that will be sold. This is what we've seen as in response to climate. And what we've had is that we've had 600,000 people leave, be forced to leave the island because they don't have stable housing anymore, because the lands that they ancestrally and historically have used are now being sold, reclassified through, you know, not the most non-transparent, non-accountable means. And you know, and in the face of, you know, what we just saw two weeks ago, absolute distrust in government to be able to respond to the, and meet the most basic needs of people, food, water, housing, shelter. Your time, my time's up, right? Got it in quickly. Um, <laughs> and I just want to briefly want to mention one thing in response to um, our first speaker, um, Alex, I believe, who, who talked about, you know, the role of the diaspora in a lot of this, because as the diaspora grows, regardless of the nation, precisely because of forced migration, and in rethinking, you know, what are our, as we call it, Boricua buyback programs, you know, what are, what are the initiatives that we need to be thinking about and investing in to make it possible, in this case, for Puerto Ricans to live in Puerto Rico, in, in the case of, you know, for, for people to be able to just stay where they're at, because it isn't just that those lands are not going to be, you know, 
habitable or suitable is that they're not going to be for the people there. It doesn't mean that there isn't economic planning for, the, for those lands and some other purpose. And so thinking about what is our role as an increasing and growing diaspora to be able to make sure that people have the capacity to stay where, um, where they want, regardless of climate impact. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I'm really looking forward to our Q&A, uh, but we have one more presenter, Alex. Thank you very much. I'm um, really enjoying the presentations, and I think it's a rich kind of rich multidisciplinary and uh, legal and policy discussion. So I'm going to be bringing in more of the, the sort of scientific perspective. Um, my uh, presentation has two parts. One, I'll be describing some work that we did to model future climate change migration with the World Bank, uh, looking at issues around water availability, crop production, and sea level rise. Uh, and then the second part is some work that I did uh, about a decade ago, um, which looked at uh, planned relocation or resettlement as one response uh, to some of these climate impacts. Uh, so I'll start in on the, uh, the work that we did with the bank, which resulted in this report called Groundswell, which was published in 2018 uh, with a bunch of colleagues. So I want to give full acknowledgement to all the colleagues, including many of my colleagues at Season at the Earth Institute. Uh, who are involved in this. And um, basically, uh, climate migration, uh, some people debate whether it's actually happening, but I believe it is a reality. Uh, you know, we can't necessarily go out and pin uh, name tags to people and say you're a climate migrant or not, but there are, uh, increasingly climate is playing a role in, in driving many people to, to relocate, to move, uh, as we've just heard about in the case of Puerto Rico and Fiji and other parts of the world. Um, so this is happening against a backdrop of major demographic shifts. We have land degradation and things that Michael Gerard spoke to earlier uh, and our colleague from the UNCCD. We have the breakdown of institutions and governance systems in many parts of the world uh, in places like I was a Sahel-based Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, and uh, I never thought that things would reach kind of the levels that they have in terms of both international migration out of the region and the kind of breakdown in in order in many parts of those of that region. Uh, you have this global effort to achieve the SDGs, which um, is very ambitious. And we have the rise of nationalist politics in many parts of the global north, basically trying to prevent people from coming into their countries. Um, so the World Bank commissioned this work because they wanted to know essentially three things. Um, they wanted to know how climate change might impact land-based uh, livelihoods and ways that might trigger migration as an adaptation response. Uh, they wanted to look uh, at what client governments could start doing about it, as well as maybe with assistance of the World Bank. And they wanted to look at it, um, you know, whether some of their investments in things like climate smart agriculture or water resource management actually were sustainable in the long run, given the potential magnitude of climate change out to 2050. So our time frame was up to 2050. We took a scenario-based approach in our modeling. So we had three scenarios. One was called a reference scenario, which is a pessimistic scenario. Under that reference scenario, basically, you have high emissions, RCP 8.5. I don't have time to spell out these acronyms. I apologize. If you're in the climate field, you know what they are. And then uh, the SSP, which is the Shared Socioeconomic Pathway, is uh, number four, the fourth pathway is basically one in which you have high and growing inequality in the world. Uh, so it's sort of the world is not going on a very sustainable path socially as well as climatically. Then you contrast that with the more inclusive development scenario, which basically takes high emissions but lower uh, a better development pathway, SSP2, or you can contrast it with a more climate-friendly scenario, which has low emissions and uh, the same sort of bad development scenario. So if you're going out to 2030, we're talking about a world where temperatures may rise at the upper level at 1.5 degrees C, the lower level about 0.5 degrees C, uh, and then 2050 was sort of our, the, the 
target it for the end of our projections, and that's a world where at the high end you might have 2.5 degrees C and a low end of 0.6 degrees C. Very briefly, our method was essentially to take existing projections of population that are spatial. So we're looking at grid cells. I'm a geographer. Apologies for those of you who didn't study GIS in undergrad or graduate school. But uh, you take these gridded population projections, so they're actually spatial, and you look at a, on the right-hand column, you look at those spatial population projections for the different development scenarios. And then what we did is we added climate impacts as a factor that would essentially make areas more or less attractive. So if you decline in water availability and you decline in your crop production, it's going to become less attractive in the future. And this model, which is called a population gravity model, will move people out of those less attractive areas and into those more attractive areas. Then what you do is you compare the development only scenario or the climate the, the development, uh, we call it the no climate scenario, the development only scenario on the right hand column to the scenario that includes climate impacts and you can subtract, basically do arithmetic to subtract and where you essentially subtract um, the non-climate scenario from the climate scenario, you basically get a difference. And if you sum up all the positive cells in that country, and this is done on a country by country basis, you get the total climate migration for that country. But you get more, and I'll show you what you get as well. You get spatial uh, maps that show you where uh, people are likely to be moving out of and into as a result of some of these climate impacts. So, Behind each of those three scenarios, we had four model runs, and these model runs included the impact scenarios, the GCM, or global climate model, and different levels of, um, uh, different levels of emissions. And so what we see here is in the pessimistic scenario, you have these four model runs for Ethiopia, and you basically average them to come out with an overall map. The blue areas, uh, which may be difficult to pick out here, are in the north, in the sort of the highlands of the north, and there are areas of out-migration, and in the highlands of the south, you see more in-migration. Uh, we, we ran this by experts in Ethiopia. We had a workshop in Ethiopia, and they said, we're seeing some of this happen already. And so some of that is actually unfolding. Uh, these, I'm going to skip through quickly, but these basically show you the anomalies in the future in terms of, from the baseline, kind of historical climate conditions to the future, the blue areas are going to be more wet in a water availability model, and uh, the red areas will become drier. In the bottom row and the second row, you basically see RCP 8.5. So that's a high emission scenario. That's where we're tracking now, and so that's where I would you know, focus. A lot of South Asia actually looks wetter in, in these scenarios, except for uh, uh, Afghanistan. But much of Central America, I'll note, is looking uh, increasingly dry, up to 90% uh, reductions in, in water availability. These are the crop production projections. Again, I don't have time to dwell on those, but basically if you run these then through this modeling framework, you can come up with total numbers by region, and we had these three focus regions of, uh, in this case, you see on the right, East Africa, uh, up to 50 million migrants, I'm sorry, 100 million migrants, and uh, in the pessimistic scenario, what you will notice is that in each case, the modeling actually produces the highest number of climate migrants under the pessimistic reference scenario. Uh, the more climate friendly invariably comes in at a slightly lower levels. The white bars are basically the uncertainty levels or the uh, confidence intervals around each of the uh, scenarios. Um, so this is South Asia with much higher numbers, primarily because it's a much more populous area. So there's about 30 million people, 35 million people in that region that would be affected, potentially climate migrants by 2050. These are the maps that I was mentioning earlier. And essentially focusing on the right-hand panel of each of these, what you see is highlands typically are more attractive. Red areas are in-migration hotspots. In blue areas are areas where migration would likely be occurring out of those areas because of climate impacts. A lot of the blue areas are along the coast and in areas that will be drier or uh, have reduced crop production. Um, so it's essentially a what if scenario, what could happen under certain climate conditions. Um, the uh, livelihood zones are simply a lens or a way of looking at land-based livelihoods and saying where will people be moving into and out of. 
in both Central America and Mexico and in East Africa, a lot of migration out of rain-fed agricultural systems into denser urban settlements and in also some cases into pastoral and rangelands. So uh, the take home from this is basically that we think these are low end estimates for the most part, um, but there's also some real issues about where people are gonna move. And I think Michael raised a really important question at the very beginning was, we can talk about where people will leave from, but where will they move? Some of these red areas are not uh, on the maps, are not prepared fully to, uh, to adequately kind of address this. Um, maybe I'll skip just to the conclusions of the resettlement stuff. This was work we did and was published in Science in 2011, so you can look up that publication. Basically what we're talking about is the fact that um, we can learn from past development force displacement and disaster force displacement lessons. So we can learn from those and actually apply them to the special case of climate change migration. And we looked at issues around new infrastructure for both um, adaptation and for mitigation projects. Uh, so these were things that I think Michael and others here have really addressed well, as well as direct climate impacts like sea level rise, drought, um, desertification, and floods. And these things will be moving people. There's already evidence that there is display, uh, resettlement going on already, and these are some of the example countries. China has been at the forefront with a very proactive approach, and I can talk more about that if you're interested, because I visited a number of resettlement projects in China over the last couple of years. And uh, we need things like legal protections, participation, equity. Uh, we need capacity building for the professionals involved. Um, and we need impact assessments for monitoring and evaluation. We need more research to uh, you know, establish a benchmark for this work and finance because unlike development force displacement and resettlement where dams and other infrastructure pay for your cost of resettlement, basically as our distinguished ambassador said, there is no fund that's already there to fund this kind of work. So I will leave my conclusions on the screen and uh, let's get into the discussion. Thank you, Alex. Okay, so I, 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 this was a lot, and, and thank you all for such a rich discussion. I think we have a lot to digest here, but something that all of you mentioned was the intersection of migration and displacement issues with economic issues. Uh, Alex, you just mentioned that finance is needed. Um, Ambassador Prasad, you mentioned that your own government is the one that's paying for relocation, even though arguably Fiji is not responsible for climate change. Natasha, you also mentioned how austerity measures in the economic situation in Puerto Rico um, is affecting this issue. So I'm wondering what, in your all of your opinions, what do you think would really build economic capacity to respond? And that could be at a national level, that could be at a community level, that could be at an individual level. And then more generally, what, what are the systems that need to be in place to reduce the impacts from displacement? Start you off with an easy one. Is this okay? That's um, yeah, lowball question to start off with. Um, well, one, I mean, the first in terms of kind of um, economic fortitude and being able to strengthen um, government's responses. Obviously, climate change is a resource question, ultimately. I mean, survival is a resource question, really. We're not talking about people dying. We're talking about who's going to die right? or who's going to have to be or who's going to migrate, right? Because there will always be people who have the capacity to survive hardship. So, and so to the extent that it's really, you know, economically disadvantaged and poor nations that are gonna bear the brunt, and particularly in the global south, the nations of color, they're gonna bear the brunt of climate change. How do we make it more possible for them to be able to free up resources to be able to respond? Perhaps that's, you know, debt relief, sovereign debt relief, whatever debt relief um, it is. But also I think thinking of, an, you know, prioritizing an economic model that really ultimately centers um, the needs of that particular nation or economy around their own survival. And that's just not how economies are designed. 
as we think about it now. That's a much more macro question. On the micro piece, the second piece was around um, community response, is that right? I mean, we're seeing tremendous community resilience, and I don't mean resilience in the, in the overused sense of the word resilience. In Puerto Rico, how communities have responded after the hurricane is one, um, to really shift their notion and relationship to the state to not only look at government as being the one that's gonna get them out, but really thinking about building interdependent relationships amongst each other um, so that when I get water, you have water. Uh, and, and rethinking all forms of sovereignty, you know, food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, um, you know, community decision making at the most local levels, really rethinking what, what it means for them to survive, literally survive. Um, and there's tremendous examples of what that looks like at all levels. We don't have time to go through that now, but I wanna say that there are models and there are communities modeling that for us already that exist. I don't think that we have to spend a lot of time thinking about it because people will always rise up to the occasion when it comes to their survival to think about how to get out of, um, how to get out of these situations. And so we're, we've, we've seen, and I think this summer, even though it's done in a different kind of context, is actually a response to that as well. Is it? So uh, won't answer the full full question, but a few uh, quick remarks from my side. Uh, we're in the zone of roll up your sleeves and get on with it. It's uh, the every day you wait is a day too many. And uh, but I only spoke about uh, the difficulties of community relocation. You have to relocate infrastructure. We have borrowed from the World Bank and ADB $400 million to move our water supply 10 miles inshore. And uh, uh, every road uh, that we now make uh, costs three, four times more. So in some of our, our countries, we are making the most expensive uh, roads because the aggregates that you use are 10 times more than what the engineers told us 30 years back or 40 years back. Uh, but in some places, we are also using roads as a uh, to keep the uh, sea away from uh, uh, agricultural land. So there are many other dimensions, but I, th I thought the uh, discussion was on the community aspect, which I, I focused on. And uh, so, yes, we're in the roll up your sleeves and get on with, the, with it. Uh, it's a beautiful modeling, but if you waited for modeling like this, I think uh, uh, that would also, it's, it's good, good, good work, and I congratulate you. Uh, on that, but by and large in coastal communities and uh, well, you see it with your eyes, right? Uh, what is going to happen or you see it with historical data because last 100 year weather events or 50 year weather events, uh, catastrophes including slow onset droughts, etc. you begin to see it over five, 10 year period. So, and, and every policy maker is reasonably grown up to understand these trends, thanks. So uh, the money, where it's going to come from, um, I think that's a real, you know, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Um, and, you know, I'd like to say something like the Green Climate Fund, but we just heard from Ambassador Prasad that, you know, countries are not necessarily jumping to the front of the queue to fund relocation and uh, resettlement efforts. Uh, even a country that's as vulnerable uh, to sea level rise as Fiji. So. Um, I think one other issue that we need to look at is cost, cost effectiveness. So uh, Michael Gerard mentioned earlier in his opening remarks a conference which I co-organized uh, called uh, the Managed Retreat Conference, which was in June of this year. And um, one of the things that we learned about is some efforts in the U.S. to relocate communities, um, in one case, uh, Ile de Jean Charles in, in Louisiana. And the short story is that the U.S. government has spent probably uh, four million plus dollars plus uh, some state funds on top of that to re relocate a, a community of about a hundred people um, and it's become a fiasco um, largely because of restrictions on the kind of things that the U.S. government can and can't fund. Our policies aren't in alignment with uh, what needs to be done in some of these community situations, particularly where they're indigenous communities and they want to stay together and they want to live in an exclusive area rather than be mixed in with other populations somewhere inland. Um, so um, the question then becomes kind of which of these models is actually most cost effective in helping people out? Do you give them cash transfers and say, you know, go, you're a Katrina survivor, 
figure it out. You know, take some money and we'll get you started, but you're gonna, be able, you're gonna have to figure it out somewhere else. Do you actually relocate them in a top-down model like in China, which I've visited uh, and, and seen some of those efforts? Uh, or do you, you know, do um, sort of overseas, you know, that's kind of the overseas re resettlement model, but there's also uh, kind of um, some probably in-between types of models. And so doing it cost-effectively is going to be extremely important moving forward. Great. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions from the audience, I can gather a few. Um, yeah, you in the back. Um, anyone else? We'll take about three. Great. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a concern with the statement that we may not necessarily be able to classify migrants. Um, I think it's imperative that in nomenclature for this evolving situation reflects that um, many countries will have obligations, legal obligations, to deal with migrants, be it a refugee and asylum seeker um, or an economic migrant. And it's important that we, we put this in writing legally so that they know what they can and cannot do. The second point, um, it's not exactly climate change related, but it does impact on the environment. I'm from a small island in the Caribbean. We are right next to a larger nation that has a major political, geopolitical issue. Um, and of course, their economy is in crisis. As a result of that, we are faced with the onslaught of huge migration into the country. The island is very small. It is way beyond the carrying capacity. The economic costs are very high, and I'm worried about the long-term epidemiological and other issues that is related to this migration. So I think it's something that we need to tackle um, very seriously. So again, my question pertains to um, the classification system as it relates to legal obligations from host nations, and the other one has to do with um, other conflicts, as well as climate change, causing mass migration into SIDS that creates havoc. Thanks. Um, we'll take a question from Mike. Great. Thank you. Um, Alex, you know I'm a huge fan of your work, and it was great to see it all presented, but I'm going to direct my question to these two. Um, so Natasha and Ambassador Prasad, I guess, um, Natasha, I know there's been a lot of legal uh, work in Puerto Rico in the aftermath to deal with some of the disparate impacts of um, the, the failure to provide disaster relief, for instance. And I, do, I, I would love to just hear a little bit more from you about that. What are the legal avenues for redress that um, people who have not received the help that they are owed um, have sought? Um, and Ambassador Prasad, I guess on a, a similar um, sort of line of legal thinking, um, you know, there's, there's long been talk of legal redress for small island states and for other countries um, that are more vulnerable to climate change. And uh, I wouldn't ask you to commit to suing any country or any corporate actor here. But I do wonder if, um, you know, if the, if the idea of, of legal obligations and legal avenues of redress plays a role in the way that you think about um, the, the relocation issue. Great, thank you. We'll take one last question. Um, if any women have any questions, now is your chance. I will prioritize you. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the range of interventions that are available to extend the viability of risk, uh, highly risk zones, assuming, I think, the pessimistic case that migratory forces are going to happen but can we, for example, introduction of salt-tolerant species, uh, introduction of water management practices so you can retain and build water tables even though the drought is coming and it's going to get worse, so that perhaps we would have 20 years to handle some of these big population migration issues instead of 10. So it's sort of like an interim step to give us more time. Great. One more question going once, going twice. Ladies, I need you to step up. Okay, so um, anyone want to take the question, any of these legal obligations? Natasha, do you want to start us off? Sure. And it's a great question. Um, you know, in the U.S., disaster aid is often what territories and states rely on to be able, from the federal level, to be able to, to recover. 
in the case of Puerto Rico, what we've seen is just really a blatant policy of discrimination against the island and, re and withholding aid, well, and the failure to respond, really criminal negligence and the failure to respond for months and months and years. And then once aid was allo allotted to withhold the aid, that aid continues to be withheld. And actually some of that aid was diverted to the border, you know, there's back and forth. Uh, conversation. It's been unfortunately very frustrating and there's limited legal remedies to be able to address that. Um, we did sue the federal government, for example, to try to allow for um, climate refugees, evacuees who were forced to leave the island, about 300,000 in the first three months when there was no water or, um, or electricity, to get them extra time in hotels as temporary shelter assistance. Um, this particular administration uh, didn't didn't agree that they needed to extend the time and they were going to send people back. Their only offer was a one-way ticket back to Puerto Rico to nothing. We got a few extra months, but the reality is the law is not designed to, to either recognize these rights. It's certainly not designed to recognize, at least domestically, climate refugees. As it is, there's already an attack on refugees as a whole, much less climate refugees. And so the legal remedies are really limited as to how do we... Because what are we asking for? Well, we're asking for people to be able to live dignified lives where they live, where they are, to not have to migrate in the first place, but to the extent that they have to, to be recognized as a migrant because citizenship doesn't protect them here. Puerto Ricans have an imposed citizenship. Citizenship isn't what's guaranteeing them housing in New York or Connecticut or wherever else that they have to flee to or anywhere else. They're not guaranteed that right. So there's a huge normative gap and the law to be able to address this in a way that's really systemic and that anticipates this because we don't see the government's response to Florida and Texas and New Orleans the same way, right? They also, hurricanes, you know, Irma and Harvey devastated some of those communities and they got aid immediately. It's obviously a political calculation. All aid is a political calculation, but that's why the law is really, unfortunately, limited. We sh lawyers aren't gonna solve, our, solve this, really. So on the legal, I, I focus on the in, internally legal. There are just so many range of uh, legal issues in Fiji and many of our type of societies. Land is uh, communally uh, owned uh, by groups. So whenever you're relocating, uh, there are all sorts of uh, paralegal type of issues that have, been, have to be resolved in uh, inter-community dispute and new dispute resolutions and that whole universe that's uh, taken for granted. Uh, but if you're looking for climate-related legal issues, you know, you, you, uh, you can just keep on inventing it every, uh, every second. Just where, where do you want to look? 30, 40 years ago, the Australian engineering standards were applied to to the Pacific, and we were told that the uh, build, uh, buildings that will be covered by insurance should uh, be able to withstand 160 knots of uh, wind, and we built all our government architecture on that, and suddenly uh, that's, if you now have a 150 knot hurricane, you laugh, you know, nothing, just little things will be blown away, etc. Most of them are 200 knots plus, as you have seen in Bahamas, so that's the category hell, is the new category normal. Uh, so we can sue them, uh, insurance companies, you could sue insurance companies. Uh, uh, we drew insurance for my mother's house can no longer be insured. So it was a house worth probably $20,000 and now no one will buy it because no one can take a loan against that. Uh, but when we're building the house, you know, it was, it followed all the uh, legal norms uh, that were available. So across the, I think, development space, uh, you can go across and their internal a uh, uh, whole set of uh, legal issues, which I think uh, smart lawyers can uh, uh, can uh, go all the way to the bank with. So that's uh, one side, but on the inter uh, sort of the global legal issue, that's as you know much better than me, very complicated. Yes, I understand that Vanuatu, for example, wants to go uh, and test this out, and there are a few countries which will test it out, and some of them will win. And uh, but uh, I think the calculation you need to make is whether it will be worth the political effort uh, uh, to go, uh, go down that uh, that path. But nevertheless, we will back any country or any sets of countries which wants to take on uh, some of the giants, uh, even if to score a point or two, not to get any money. Thanks.
Yeah, thanks, Alex. Do you want to jump in on carrying capacity? Or well, I'll solution? try to answer two of the questions that were raised about climate migrants okay. as a category and in situ adaptation. So indeed, uh, in situ adaptation, crop varieties, yeah. irrigation, things like that are all going to be vitally important. Uh, the World Bank certainly not withdrawing from what's called climate smart agriculture. It's just they want to make sure that they're investing in areas where agricultural suitability will be viable in, in the longer term. So if you're starting to see a 90% or more reduction in water, that could be a signal that it's you know, no longer going to be viable to do a particular type of crop production. Um, so the, I, should have, you know, I should add that the model did not include in situ adaptation measures beyond what's already in place like irrigation and sort of our current crop varieties. So it did not talk about you know, genetic, uh, ad, uh, new genetic varieties or that kind of thing. Um, climate migrants, this is a really interesting topic and it's one that actually the Sabin Center hosted a workshop on or conference on a couple years ago where they talked about, you know, the Marshall Islands and a lot of states and what happens to a state when it disappears. I think the case of people who leave small island states is a much clear cut case of, you know, especially if they're on the, at the waterfront and they simply can't live in places like uh, Kiribati that are, you know, uh, coral atolls. Uh, they will be submerged and people will need to leave and they will be clearly climate migrants. I think the, the ma vast majority of migration in, in the next century or this century and into the next century is going to be people who are leaving uh, areas for a whole variety of reasons, of which climate may become an increasingly important forcing factor. So their livelihoods are eroded, they've lost assets, and they're no longer able to subsist where they are. And um, you know, part of the, the third reason the bank kind of wanted to fund this work that I didn't mention is really to avoid distress migration, which we've seen, you know, increasingly. Uh, you could say some parts of Africa, some of the migrants out of Africa, and certainly many of the migrants out of Syria are in a distress mode, and they simply are seeking safety and security. One other element I wanted to mention about finance is I think, unfortunately, a lot of what's going to cause, uh, you know, fall on the shoulders uh, in terms of the financial burden will be the local communities and the local families, the, the, the kinship network, which is going to be essentially helping and bailing out family members who are in very distressed situations. I think we need to recognize that as well. Um, we are at time, so please join me in thanking our panelists.